evening. More than a hundred years ago, photography replaced the human eye for most branches of astronomy. In fact, today, there are very few professional astronomers who actually look through telescopes. Consider the great William Herschel telescope on La Palma. You can't look through that. Well, today, photography is itself being superseded by electronic devices. And there are some people who say that photography is on the way out. That certainly isn't true. Come with me to the Anglo-Australian Observatory in Siding Spring, New South Wales. And there, there are two big telescopes. The UKS, or United Kingdom Schmidt, and the great AAT, or Anglo-Australian Telescope, with its 159-inch mirror. And the world's leading astronomical photographer, Dr. David Malin, uses the two, these two telescopes to take colour photographs of celestial objects. And I may say, his photographs are not only lovely to look at, they are also of tremendous scientific value, and they've led to exciting new discoveries. Well, we're delighted that David is over here briefly, and he's going to be able to join us today. Welcome back to the Skype night, David. Thank you, Patrick. What exactly are you doing over here? I'm giving a series of talks here and there, Patrick, uh, based at the, around the Edinburgh Science Festival, but also professional talks uh, in various venues around Britain. Well, you're celebrated for your colour photographs, but many people say that the sky is rather black and white to look at. It looks rather black and white, I agree. Certainly when you look through a telescope, you don't see very much colour, but that's largely due to the human eye. The human eye is very poor at seeing colour when the light levels are low. But the colour is certainly there, and you can extract it. Well, can you show us exactly how you do it? Well, you need rather specialised techniques to, uh, to bring out the colour of the faintest astronomical objects. And what we do, what we prefer to do, is to take three black and white plates uh, and expose them through colour filters to rebuild the colour images later in the, in the laboratory. Uh, this is a rather tedious way of making colour pictures, but it's very effective. And as you say, it brings out images that uh, are scientifically useful as well. What about the Orion Nebula? That must be a good subject. Oh, the Orion Nebula is terrific because it's so bright and so full of detail. And uh, w when we take a picture of it, though, it looks rather flat and, and featureless. Until we apply some special techniques to it, uh, a technique called unsharp masking, for instance, which I've developed in Australia, brings out the finest detail, and, and you see this on this black and white photograph. But then, of course, we can apply that to colour photography as well and make a three-colour image using those techniques of the Orion Nebula, which shows things that you can't see on any normal kind of picture. It certainly works. What exactly is unsharp masking? Unsharp masking is a rather elegant way of deriving very fine details, or obtaining very fine details, in pictures that don't at first show them. These details are real, but they're hidden in the high, high brightness, high density of the photographic plate. Well, you've shown us the main part of the Orion Nebula, but there's more to it than that. Yes, I found a, a rather interesting reflection nebula deep inside the Orion Nebula. Uh, in, in black and white, that shows itself as uh, just a tangle of wispy, wispy nebula, and gas and dust and so on. But as soon as you introduce colour, as soon as you make the colour picture, then the three-dimensional nature of this object becomes obvious. And we begin to see relationships between the various parts of the picture that just aren't noticeable in black and white. Well, that is a bright nebula, but we have dark nebulae too. And, of course, you must have photographed the famous horse's head nebula in Oran. Oh, the horse head nebula is, is a wonderful thing. It was, of course, was first discovered photographically. It's, it's uh, really too faint to be seen by eye. Uh, and we certainly photographed that, but once again we had to use three black and white exposures uh, to, to, to build a colour image. Uh, and, of course, with, with three pictures, you, you have a black and white that contains the, the, the uh, blue light information, and here it is, seen in blue light. And then you take another picture at some other time in green light, uh, and this is how this looks. Uh, and then you take a red light picture, and this is how it appears. And eventually you begin to combine these together, you add together the blue and the green, for instance, and finally you put in the red, and all of a sudden the picture bursts into life, and you can see all of the colours that are there. These colours are very subtle and very informative. And there's the horse head, rather to the right of centre. It does look like the head of a knight in chest, doesn't it? Indeed it does, lovely. An amazing thing, over a thousand light years away. Yes. And let's go further afield now. What about some of these fainter things, these cometary globules, for example? Well, these photographic techniques which don't use colour film, are capable of revealing the very faintest things. And some of the most interesting and faint objects are so-called cometary globules. These are blobs of dust, uh, which are illuminated by stars not too far away from them. And so far, they've only been photographed in black and white. Uh, and you see an image of one here. They look rather, rather weird mm. objects. They do indeed. But as soon as you're able to introduce the colour element into them, you begin to see things that are quite unexpected. For instance, there's a red glow here due to hydrogen being released by starlight pressuring this cometary globule. And then there's a long blue tail uh, dragging off the, off, the, off the back part of it. This is a, uh, dust being blasted away by, by starlight. And the whole thing looks as though it's about to devour a spiral galaxy. Of course, the galaxy itself is billions of light years away, whereas a dust globule is perhaps a few hundred. 
Well, her, the, the globule is fairly near at hand. But I remember way back in 1987, a supernova burst out in the large cloud of Magellan, 169,000 light years away, and became very bright with the naked eye. I flew down to South Africa to, to, to have a look at it. Well, that's the relic of an exploding star, and I imagine that interested you very much. It certainly changed the lives of astronomers in the Southern Hemisphere for, for two or three years, because, as you say, it was the first naked eye supernova. It was a really exciting event, visible in the large Magellanic cloud. I was able to pop out and have a look at it down my street and see at the bottom of, bottom of, my, bottom of my road. Wonderful. Well, after the explosion was over, we had these curious reflection rings. I think you've got some lovely photographs of those. Yes, the supernova, of course, was very bright, rather like a flash bulb going off in the large Magellanic cloud. And a, a sphere of light spread out from the, from the supernova and is now uh, encountering sheets of dust between ourselves and the supernova and being reflected by it. And, and those reflections are, in fact, the light echo of the, of the supernova. And once again, you, you need some rather special ways of, of revealing those, those images. Uh, this is a negative picture of the field of view of the supernova before it exploded in 19... Uh, this photograph was taken in 1984. The supernova, of course, went off in 87. And right in the middle of the field of view, you see the star that was to become supernova. Now the supernova has exploded and faded away. And now if we look at the same field of view, you can see just superimposed on this two very faint circles of light. But of course, because we have a picture before and after the supernova, we can subtract one from the other and reveal the true image of the, of the light echo. This is the, uh, phot photography is the only real way to explore the structure of this fascinating uh, phenomenon. Uh, it shows the existence of, of, of these sheets of dust, and of course the sheets of dust are quite capable of, re of reflecting all of the light from the supernova, including its colour, and so we're able to rebuild a, a colour picture. And the other fascinating thing about the, the light echo is that it's slowly expanding, and as it does, we're able to see more and more of the uh, morphology, the shape of the distribution of the dust between the stars. What does the supernova itself look like now? The supernova is very faint now, uh, well below naked eye visibility at magnitude 17, and it's the red blob between the two bright stars on the left-hand side of, of, of this picture. It is now almost becoming a supernova remnant, uh, a, a nebula. In fact, on this picture, that, is, that image, the red image is slightly elongated, uh, and it is truly resolved. No pulsar yet? No sign of a pulsar. There may be one in there, but its radiation isn't able yet to penetrate the uh, expanding supernova remnant. Well, watch this space. Yes, Let's indeed. go further afield now and look at some curious galaxies. What about the antennae? The antennae are a, are, are a really beautiful group of galaxies, or a pair of galaxies, which are interacting. Uh, and this, there, this interaction is throwing off a, a very long stream of stars, in fact, two curved streams of stars, which give these objects their curious name. But my interest is not in the very faint streamers, it's in the two galaxies which are interacting. They're two spiral galaxies slowly coming together. And on black and white photographs, you can see structure within those spiral galaxies which tells you a good deal about how that interaction is proceeding. But again, when we take three black and whites and make the colour picture, all of a sudden, a vast amount of new information begins to appear. We can see pink star-forming regions, for instance, the tiny pink blobs you see in this photograph. We can see uh, streams of, of bluish stars, which are clearly new stars formed by this strong interaction. We can also see traces of dust left over from the interaction of these two spiral galaxies. I said that your photographs are not only lovely to look at, but also were of tremendous scientific value, and they have led to new discoveries. For example, you've discovered the galaxy now known as Maylin 1, which is actually the most massive galaxy known, and about a thousand times as massive as our Milky Way galaxy. Yes, well, those, those are spectacular numbers, but it isn't, it isn't at all a spectacular galaxy, Patrick. The arrow on this photograph points to its nucleus, and very little else can be seen there until you apply photo photographic amplification techniques. And then you begin to see a very faint fuzz around that nucleus. That is this galaxy that you mentioned, this huge galaxy. The interesting thing about it is that it's a proto-galaxy, at least we think it is. It's a galaxy that's just beginning to turn a huge cloud of hydrogen uh, into stars. And that's very unusual because almost all the galaxies we know are, are, are very ancient things indeed. Well, that's a very remote galaxy and, as I say, an exceptionally massive one. Let's have a look now at a nearer galaxy, NGC 1365 in Fornax, the furnace. A beautiful barred spiral galaxy and these are especially interesting because they show us uh, unusual regions of star formation. At the end of this uh, almost straight bar in the centre of this galaxy. Uh, at either end of it, there's a, a group of very hot stars just beginning to turn on there. Uh, and uh, as the galaxy evolves, it turns into this lovely uh, uh, curved arm barred spiral system. What about NGC 300? <laughs> yes, NGC 300 is a, is a lovely southern hemisphere spiral. Very delicate, very, very low surface brightness, very faint galaxy. We're able to show in colour that its spiral arms are almost completely blue. That means they're all made of very young, very bright stars. And we're also able to show that in its nucleus, uh, there's a single 
uh, extremely bright object that we see here, uh, almost stellar, unresolved on these uh, Anglo-Australian telescope pictures. And yet we can see the colours of the stars and the star-forming regions around it. We've been using the NGC numbers, New General Catalogue, not very new now, it came out in 1888. But of course, the main galaxies, visible from the Northern Hemisphere, were catalogued by Charles Messier, and we still use the M numbers very often. And I think one of the most famous M number galaxies is Messier 87 in Virgo. Yes, I've included this picture because it's a, it's a lovely contrast in colour between the blue, rich, uh, gas-rich star-forming galaxies we've just seen and an ancient group of stars which has long since ceased uh, active star formation, at least much of it. Uh, and this is clearly a, a yellowish object and surrounding it are very faint globular clusters, each containing many millions of stars. Uh, and this object, of course, is famous because it has a, a, a very bright jet in its nucleus, which you don't see on this photograph because the photograph is too deep. But M87 is a huge uh, and very active radio galaxy. Well, we have galaxies of all kinds, have spirals and barred spirals and irregulars, and of course we do have starburst galaxies, where new stars are being formed at a furious rate. Mm, the, the, the range of galaxies, of course, reflects the enormous range of masses that they cover, but I have a picture of a, a new picture of a galaxy, an irregular galaxy, NGC 1313, which is a, a typical starburst galaxy. It looks, it looks as though the stars have popped off in, 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 in sporadic clouds all over the galaxy's surface, and that's exactly what has happened, this sporadic star formation occurring here. At uh, first we thought this was an interacting galaxy, but radio observations show that the gas distributed throughout it is, is, is distributed in a very regular sort of way. So something has triggered uh, star formation across this galaxy. In Australia, you do have one tremendous advantage over us. You can see the far southern stars, which are exceptionally interesting. I remember when I first went down there, um, I had a look at 30 Doradus, the Tarantula Nebula, and it really does look like a tarantula, in the large cloud of Magellan. Yes, well, you can see this, of course, with the unaided eye, and with a good telescope under very good conditions, you can see the central so-called star is, in fact, a, a, a very large but compact cluster. Uh, this is a very curious object because it was originally thought to be composed of a, of a single star that had a mass about a thousand times that of the Sun. Such masses can't exist, they can't survive for long, and recently it's been resolved and shown that this group of stars is in fact uh, a group of uh, perhaps 10 or 12 extremely massive and active stars, but they're separate individuals. The lovely thing about it, though, is that you can see this uh, object with the unaided eye, even though it's 170,000 light years away. It's an incredible thing. Of course, the large cloud does contain objects of all kinds, including globular clusters, but we have globular clusters in our own galaxy, too. Yes, I've, I've recently been taking some pictures of globular clusters. At long last, I've solved the problem of showing the colours of the stars in, in globular clusters. That's amazing. Uh, when, uh, when I first got into astronomy, everybody said, well, globular clusters contain red giant stars and there are a few blue stars as well, but I was never able to see them on colour pictures. Now, this picture is of Messier 5, the central region of Messier 5, but you can just see the very subtle shades of blue and yellow of the central stars in this, in this object. Well, Messier 5 in Serpents is easily visible from here, but of course, the two best globular clusters, Omega Centauri and 47 Tucani, are not. They are too far south for us. And of the two, you know, I always think that 47 Tucani is the more spectacular. It is the more spectacular. It, it has this very compact nucleus, and of course, interesting things are going on in there. There are uh, pulsars being formed, for instance, which is a great surprise to astronomers, because globular clusters are very ancient objects, and pulsars you expect to find as remnants of relatively young stars that have exploded as supernovae. And what seems to be happening here is that the, con the concentration of stars in this object is so great uh, that they're interacting with one another and spinning each other up into, into pulsars. Let's have a look now at something rather more gentle, a nice reflection nebula, NGC 6188. The colours of these things are absolutely beautiful. I, I, I really enjoy making these pictures because you, you, when you produce them, of course, nobody's seen this colour before. This is the first time that the colour image has been made. And this one shows a lovely blue reflection nebula, starlight scattered from dust, surrounded by a, a region of emission. And together these colours merge and produce a most beautiful and satisfying image. You know, a long time ago, must be over 30 years ago now. My old friend Bart Bock joined me in this program to talk about very young stars. Sadly, of course, he's now died. But it was Bart Bock who first drew attention to these strange dark masses now known as Bock globules. B Bart Bock was a, an expert on the Milky Way. He, he wrote a wonderful book called The Milky Way, which, he is, was still, a which, is, which is still in print and is, is a wonderful book. But he drew attention to very tiny, discrete uh, globules of uh, obscuring material, hiding the, night, the light of, of nebula, uh, nebulae beyond them. Initially, he, he thought they were star-forming regions, and, and they may well be, uh, because they contain quite a lot of material. Each of these tiny blobs contains enough matter to make six or seven stars like the Sun. Uh, but we see them only by virtue of the fact that they hide the light of this luminous uh, nebula behind them.
We know of other dark matter also. For example, there are dark lanes in the famous Trifid Nebula. Yes, the, the Trifid is a, is a beautiful object. It's got three dark lanes crossing it, and that's actually how it got its name. Trifid mean cut into three. It's a, a lovely red emission nebula surrounded by, at least partially surrounded, by a, by a blue reflection nebula. But because these are black and white plates, we can extract more information from them and show that, in fact, the blue reflection nebula goes all the way around the, 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 the Trifid, uh, producing some very interesting effect where, where it meets the emission region. Well, the Trifid nebula is fairly bright. You can see it with a small telescope. They're not like that, of course. But let's turn now to something really remarkably faint, that extraordinarily dim planetary nebula you were talking about. Yes, uh, I've uh, found a planetary nebula which I can't find in any catalogue of these objects. I mean, many planetary nebulae are known, but this one is so faint it doesn't seem to appear in any list that I can find. Uh, and because it's faint, of course, the, the picture, the plates from which it was made have had to be contrast enhanced a great deal, which is why this image that you see is, is rather grainy. But it does show the true colours of this extraordinarily faint planetary nebula. And the central star is that blue one, is it? It is, yes. That's the star that provides the energy that uh, illuminates the whole of the object. I suppose one of the most famous objects in the sky is the Crab Nebula. Have you photographed that? Well, yes and no. Um, I haven't taken the plates to photograph it because it's very difficult to see from Australia. It's, mm, it's it a is. Northern Hemisphere of object. But we obtained some plates from the 200-inch telescope at Palomar that were taken in the 1960s uh, for a, 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 an entirely different project. But in, these, in this group of plates, there were some uh, images which we could build into a, a colour picture. And this is a new, and probably the deepest colour picture of the Crab Nebula that's ever been, ever been made. But, but also, uh, with these plates came some images that were absolutely very boring indeed. They were polarisation pictures of the central region of the, of, the, of the crab. And by subtracting one from the other, I've been able to reconstruct an image which shows the three-dimensional polarisation structure of the crab nebula, which in turn reveals the magnetic fields that drive this object. Some of these nicknames are lovely. It was the Earl of Ross who called the Crab Nebula the Crab Nebula. And then what about that lovely southern cluster, the Jewel Box? The Jewel Box was named by Sir John Herschel. He saw through his telescope what he described as a casket of beautifully various coloured precious stones. And it is a rather lovely thing. In there, there is a, a single star, a red giant star, that will soon become a supernova. And of course, it'll completely obliterate uh, our beautiful image of the, of the Jewel Box. Uh, and supernova leave behind actually very interesting remnants. I have a, a new picture of uh, the Vela supernova remnant, for instance, uh, here it is. Unfortunately, it was crossed by a satellite trail right in the middle of the, of the green exposure, and this is an increasing hazard uh, when, when you're taking pictures of this kind. That's becoming an increasing nuisance, I quite agree. Well, David, you've given us a wonderful picture show. Let's end up now with an edge-on galaxy. I like this particularly because it's almost like having a view of our own Milky Way from outside. If we would climb outside our galaxy and look back at it, this is very much what we would see, a collection of uh, thousands of stars uh, in this flat, uh, flat shape. It's a lovely picture, but just occasionally your pictures are put to other uses, aren't they? Yes, I'm delighted to say it. they've been recently been used on Australian postage stamps. As you <laughs> see, they make a, quite a, a pretty collection uh, to commemorate uh, uh, International Space Year. David, it's a superb collection. Thank you very much indeed, and come back soon. Thank you. Don't forget, it's newsletter time. If you want your newsletter, then send your stamped addressed envelope to newsletter number 45, The Sky at Night, BBC TV, London, W127RJ. Or, of course, you can dial our information line, 0898 000, Or you can call up CFAX, page 626. Next month is a rather special sky at night. It's our 35th anniversary. We began in April 1957. That was before the space age started. And we are doing a special program called Space for Astronomy. So I do hope you'll join me on the evening of April the 26th for our 35th anniversary. Until then, good night. <laughs>